Good morning, church. Welcome to Midtown Church Online. I'm Melinda, and I'm so excited to be with you this morning. I'm ready for a great Sunday. We're getting ready to start with worship. Then we'll hear an encouraging word from Pastor Susie Gomez. But first off, we want to check in with you. How are you guys doing? You doing okay? We want to know because we're here for you and so are your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. They are tuning in right now and let us know in the chat, how are you doing? Do you have any praises to share? Or maybe you need some prayer? Let us know, we wanna pray for you. And while you do that, let me just say, I know that 2022 may not have started off amazing for everyone. And you know what? That's okay. No matter what you're doing or what you're going through, remember, God is with you. If you need prayer, we're here. You can leave your prayer requests in the chat box below, either publicly or privately. And those prayer requests are sent directly to our care team. Our team addresses every single prayer request that we receive. And how many of you are new to Midtown Church? Introduce yourself so we can welcome you. We'll also leave a link in the chat so you can fill out a form if you'd like to get connected. Just click the link and provide some info and someone from our team will reach out to you. Well, all right, we're just about to get started. The best way to kick off a new week is with praise and worship. Our team will lead us in a few songs. Then you'll hear some church updates and a word from Pastor Susie Gomez about why we should follow Jesus. It's time to get our praise on. Join us in worship here at Midtown where we get down and have a blessed week. We serve an amazing God, an awesome God, a great God who's seen us through another year. You can get excited about that, come on. <laughs>
a shout of praise in this place if you know you serve a great God. Hallelujah. Hey, Midtown family, happy Sunday. I'm Nikisha and I am so excited to be here with y'all today to share a few amazing things that we have going on right here at Midtown. Well, I'm sure by now you guys know that we here at Midtown, we are all about connection. So if you've been wanting to grow or get connected, we actually have a few great ways that you can do so. First up, everybody say book clubs. Yep. Midtown Book Clubs are back this month. They meet online via Zoom, so that means you can join us wherever you are. We have four amazing people facilitating studies on four different books. And you know what? I think they want to introduce themselves. Check it out. Hey, it's Pastor Krista here, and I'm excited. I'm going to be leading a book club on the book by Mark Comer called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Come and join me. Hi, I'm Andrea Thomas, and I, along with my husband, Bill Cuthbertson, will be hosting the 21-Day Daniel Fast. Join us as we fast like Daniel. Hey guys, this is Pastor O, and I'll be leading the book study for Not A Fan. Hi, I'm Pastor Rich. I'm leading the study on the pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. Well, I don't know about y'all, but those titles sound intriguing to me. <laughs> you can join the book club right now. So just visit our website, choose a book, register, and you'll get the Zoom link. Be sure to also invite a friend or two to join in with you for some good old conversation with other people in the club. Another great way to get connected is through our New to Faith class. So if you are just getting started on your faith journey, or maybe you're not exactly new to faith, but you have some questions and that's okay. Our pastors are here to help guide, equip, and encourage you on your spiritual path. If this sounds like you, be sure to consider checking out our New to Faith class, which will be offered on Tuesday, January 18th, 7 p.m. at our Sacramento campus, and Thursday, January 27th, 7 p.m. at our Elk Grove campus. All you have to do is head on over to the website to register, and you know what? We hope to see you there. Last but certainly not least, it's that time again when we remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on his birthday. And you know what? We want to invite you all to a citywide celebration. Over 2,000 people from more than 30 churches will meet at Sacramento's 27th annual Martin Luther King Jr. community gathering and celebration to celebrate the progress we've already made and to also be challenged to work toward greater racial reconciliation and harmony in Sacramento. Also, our very own former chief of police Daniel Hahn will be honored. You can join the celebration tonight at 530 Capital Christian Center or stream it online. For more info, be sure to visit MOKSacramento.com. Now, as we transition into giving, this is when we pause to worship God through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Why do we give tithes and offerings? Well, it's how we express our thankfulness, praise, and obedience to God. You guys, it's a form of worship that recognizes that everything we have already belongs to him so if you're new don't even worry about giving but if you call midtown church your home you can give by texting give today to 51400 or you can give through our app or website just simply give what god puts on your heart and start today you can give one time or you can set up a recurring giving commitment and remember you guys you don't give to midtown you give through midtown and as always we appreciate you and your faithfulness so with that being said, y'all already know what time it is. This is Midtown where we get down in the Lord, of course. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the rest of the service. Oh, wait, I almost forgot. One more thing. Go Niners! Hey! <laughs> Midtown, let's stand up on our feet today and let's call on his name together, amen?
You know, um, as a co-senior pastor of a multi-ethnic church like Midtown Church, I know that I'm influenced by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Matter of fact, the influence that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has on me goes all the way back to my childhood. I mean, through my parents and my grandparents, I was taught the significance of his life. But then on my own, I remember in college uh, going to the library and spending hours watching the Eyes on the Prize documentary or listening to uh, speeches of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or going and grabbing books where I could read his sermons and his thoughts. When I was working on my master's degree, my, my master's thesis in theology was on the teachings and the ministry praxis of Martin Luther Luther King Jr. My doctoral studies, I think I quoted him, cited him, uh, sourced some book that was talking about him uh, because his theology, his life, his words, oh my goodness, of course, made a tremendous difference in the United States of America and beyond. The reason there are so many thriving, flourishing, multiracial, multi-ethnic churches in the United States of America today, oh, it's, it's, it's gotta be connected to his vision of the beloved community, his words on how to deal with the dilemma of racism and injustice, inequality, and him presenting this vision of the beloved community as the way forward for social change, for spiritual conversion, for empowerment and dignity, so that everyone would see themselves as made in the image of God. He had more than a dream, he had a project. And that project through the civil rights movement changed so much. And so, as we look to the holiday on Monday, it's another opportunity to know that this was more than just a great American. He was more than just a great orator. He was a Christian man, a churchman, a pastor, a preacher who showed us that through Christ Jesus, we experience the greatest expression of love, reconciliation, redemption, and new possibilities. So this is why, for me, I hold uh, the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. so dear. Hey Midtown, it's Pastor Susie, and once again, it's a joy to be here with you, and I'm so glad that you're joining us online. Uh, you know, 2022 is off to an interesting start. Uh, I'm not going to lie and say that it's been great. You and I both know that things continue to change week by week, day after day. It's like we don't know what to expect. But one thing I can promise you is that the good news never changes. And today we're gonna to continue to talk about the good news. We're in the series called The Sequel, The Days After Christmas. And we're gonna look at a passage today that demonstrates just how good the good news really is. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the first followers of Jesus. And the title of today's message is Witnesses on Their Way witnesses on their way. Before Jesus left the earth, it was his followers who he called to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Uh, so these witnesses in the early church, they were called followers of the way. Remember how Jesus called himself the way, the truth, and the life. He said that no one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus is the way. So his followers were called followers of the way, and they were called witnesses. Um, and not only were followers of Jesus' witnesses on their way, on their way to follow Jesus, they were on their way in a journey to discover who they really are. They were um, on their own path of wholeness and healing, and they would become witnesses on their way, also inviting others to follow as well. 
So um, <clears throat> speaking of following, uh, how many of you grew up playing that game, Follow the Leader? It's kind of a, an, an innocent childhood game, right? Um, unfortunately, Squid Game uh, ruined a lot of innocent childhood games for a lot of us, didn't it? Uh, now, if you're one of the billions of people who watched Squid Game in the last couple of months, um, maybe like me, you thought that as you were watching the show, uh, that they would eventually play the game Follow the Leader. It seemed like a, a likely game that they would play. Um, so as each new game was introduced, I was watching, waiting to see when they were going to start playing Follow the Leader or Simon Says or something of the sort. Um, and, and while they don't play that game in the traditional sense, well, actually, they, they didn't play any of the games in a traditional sense. Um, but if, while they didn't play follow the leader per se, I think that in some ways, maybe philosophically, the, the entire series was sort of a great big game of follow the leader. Um, throughout the series, you see characters ask themselves the question, who do I follow? Do I, do I follow me? Do I follow that person? Do I trust that person? Uh, they go through all of these uh, questions asking, do I follow their advice? Uh, what, do I make alliances with this person? Uh, who's a good leader? Who's a bad leader? Uh, which way should I go? What should I do? And though there are redeeming moments th throughout the series where we see certain characters shine through with some goodness and, and can help restore a little bit of human uh, you know, hope in humanity, ultimately this game is really like a survival of the fittest death match. And, and it's an every person for themselves type of situation. And, and it seems to me like every player has to at some point ask themselves the question, what kind of person am I? Am I the kind of person that only looks out for me? Or, or am I willing to give up for the sake of others? You know, I know that some of you are probably like, Pastor Susie, really? Like, you watch Squid Game? It, it's such a gross and gruesome series. How could you watch that? But I kid you not, I'm not saying this just to make an excuse for myself or to try to sound holy. I do watch Netflix sometimes. Um, as I watched it, you know what came to mind? Mark 10.45 came to mind. Mark 10.45 says this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, you know, I'm watching Squid Game and I'm still thinking about Jesus, okay? But, <clears throat> you know, every person who competed in these twisted versions of their favorite childhood games, uh, they had hopes to come up in life. Like they were playing this game because they wanted better for themselves, uh, for their families. They wanted to come out of the debt that, that, that was putting all that pressure on them. And, and they thought that, that willing, winning the millions of dollars in prize money could get them out of that debt and, and catapult them into lives of wealth and privilege. But unfortunately, in order to get there, in order to participate in Squid Game and win, they'd have to cheat, steal, lie or take. Jesus, on the other hand, came to give up, to serve, to lay down his life so that our debts would be cleared and his followers would live life abundant. So this verse in Mark, <clears throat> Mark 10, 45 is sort of the, the thesis or the theme verse of the entire gospel account of Mark. Uh, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's completely antithetical to the ways of the world. Uh, Squid Game was this fictional, fictional narrative that, that demonstrated the worst of humanity. Uh, but the life of Jesus is a true account of one who demonstrated the ultimate good for the sake of all humanity. So believe it or not, uh, this entire sermon is not going to be a breakdown of Squid Game versus the Gospel, but I thought that this would be a good entry point to talk about what we're going to focus on today. Um, the heart of the question, uh, we're, we're looking at the followers of Jesus, and, and, and we want to ask the question, why? Why did the first followers of Jesus decide to follow Jesus? And why should you and I follow Jesus today? So our main text today is found in Mark 1, verses 16 through 20. And don't judge me, I'm going to read it off my phone only because the Bible that I brought is too heavy for the podium that I'm using. So I'm going to read off my phone. Don't judge me, okay? But Mark 1, verses 16 through 20 says this, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. 
Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone out a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So at once they left their nets and followed him. Without delay, he called them and they left everything and followed him. You know, there's a lot of crazy things that happen in the Bible from uh, Adam and Eve and the talking serpent to Noah and and the flood and the ark, uh, Moses parting the Red Sea, the virgin birth, which we just talked about, right? Um, And I mean, I, I think that you might look at tabloid headlines when you're at the supermarket and think that these are entertaining, but really, if you crack open the Bible, you know, uh, Us Weekly ain't got nothing on Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. If people think that the Bible is boring, I think they're just not paying attention. So yes, compared to some of the events that I just listed off, uh, this, this story right here, about the account of the followers, first followers of Jesus, choosing to follow Jesus, um, might not seem all that interesting. This is not all that sensational. But really, what these guys did, the first followers of Jesus, by leaving their nets, leaving their livelihood, everything that they knew to follow after Jesus, their decision was revolutionary. It, it not only revolutionized their lives, it, it revolu- revolutionized the world. And so as they followed Jesus, we're also following their lead, as we call ourselves followers of Jesus as well. So th- this right here, this is actually probably one of the most relevant and relatable passages of the Bible. Like most of us won't be called to build an ark or part a sea or give birth to the Savior of the world, but we're all called to follow after Jesus. Uh, all of us, everywhere, from back then to now and for future generations to come. This is a call that's relevant to us. So as we stop and we pay attention to the fact that these disciples left everything immediately to follow Jesus, we have to ask the question, why? What was it about Jesus that made him compelling enough to leave everything immediately and follow him? You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all give their own accounts of of this happening when when Jesus first called the first followers to follow after him. Um, But Mark is a good book to look at when you're trying to get to the heart of why the disciples might have followed Jesus. Um, The other gospel accounts, they give us some clues that we can piece together and they give us some added backstory. But the reason why I say that the book of Mark is a good one to investigate when it comes to trying to piece together why the disciples might have chosen to follow Jesus immediately, um, it's because the book of Mark kind of reads like an action movie. So it's like scene after scene, boom, boom, boom. Like think Fast and the Furious. There's just a a slew of events that happen. And Mark, he just wants to get down to the nitty gritty. He says, here's what Jesus did. Here's my account. And, you know, John, at the end of his book, he says, you know, if everything that Jesus did was to be written, there would not be enough books in the world. There would not be enough space in the world to carry all of the books that it would be required to, to take account of everything that Jesus did. So Mark just wants to get straight to the point. He's giving his best account of here's what Jesus did and here's why it matters. So, so why did it matter? Why, uh, why did the first followers of Jesus make the decision to immediately follow Jesus? If you're a note taker, here's your chance. The first point of why they made the decision to immediately follow Jesus is, is because of his proclamation. Jesus is a teacher like no other. His teaching had authority. The way that Jesus taught, the way that Jesus proclaimed truth was different from anyone else. Uh, People could sense it when he taught, he just, it it hit differently, right? And, And even evil spirits inhabiting people around him trembled in fear at his presence because they knew that Jesus had authority. So let's, what, let, let's read what happens right after Jesus calls Simon, Andrew, James, and John to follow him. In Mark, 21 verses 20, uh, what, Mark 1, verses 21 to 27, it says this, They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Jesus was different. 
Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A a new teaching and and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. When Jesus took command of a situation, he he didn't have to wax poetic or, or be verbose. He said, be quiet, come out of him, and instantly the the evil spirit left. Uh, He didn't have to convince or plead or beg or argue. At his word, the evil spirit left because he knew that Jesus, Jesus and his word had authority. Remember, Jesus is the word. He's God. He's one with God. And he was there at the beginning when at his word, God said, let there be light. And there was light. At his word, water, land, sky, and every living creature came into existence. And and Jesus has the words that we need for life. He is the word that we need. Pastor Ephraim reminded us last week that yes, sticks and stones may break our bones, but unlike that old saying goes, uh, words can hurt us. Proverbs 18, 21 tells us that the power of life and death is in the tongue. So yes, absolutely, words can hurt, but they also can bring life. And Jesus is that word that wants to bring life. Do you also notice where this takes place? Uh, When Jesus tells the evil spirit to be quiet and come out of him, they're in the synagogue. Jesus is in the middle of teaching and, and then this evil spirit cries out, And this evil spirit was seeking to reject or distract from the word of God. And Jesus was not having it. He said, be quiet, come out of him. And Jesus, already having amazed the people with with the authority of his teaching and the way that he taught, he solidifies his authority in this moment by demonstrating that even evil spirits must obey him. And this leads us to Point number two, why make the decision to immediately follow Jesus? Two, because because of his power. So in the next scene, Mark 1, verses 29 to 32, it says this, uh, As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, uh, helped her up, And the fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon-possessed. Jesus has the power to heal. He had the power back then, and he has the power now. Uh, Jesus has the power to cast out evil spirits like he did one scene prior. And Jesus has the power to deal with whatever is brought to him. Jesus has authority, and Jesus has power. You know, listen, some people, they, they might have authority in, a, in an earthly sense. Like, they, they, they might have power, but they don't have spiritual power. Some people have earthly power, but, but they don't have spiritual authority. Maybe some folks have authority because they were born into it. They, maybe they were, uh, they were given positions of power for reasons other than their actual ability. Uh, whether it be class or gender or race or a range of other factors, sometimes people enjoy positions of power because society dictates a set of advantages for them. But remember, Jesus, though he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, he emptied himself of his power for our sake. Um, Jesus came lowly and humbly, and, and his power didn't come from social position. Jesus has power that demonstrates that he is the Son of God. He had a different a kind, he had a different kind of authority, and people paid attention. They noticed. Jesus has the power to heal. He has the power to heal sickness, release people from the grip of Satan. And Jesus has the power to meet you in whatever situation you're in. If, if you need healing physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually, Jesus can meet you there. The disciples Uh, They made their decision to immediately follow Jesus because of his proclamation, because of his power, and third, and finally, because of his purpose. 
in Mark, Mark 1, verses 35 through 39, we see Jesus go off and pray in a solitary place. Um, I feel this passage on, on a whole nother level right now in this season of motherhood and, and COVID life. Uh, as a mom with four kids during COVID uh, in, and all of its variant cousins, I, I feel this passage in a different way and, and I see the reason why Jesus needed to do this. Um, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Oh my goodness, I can relate to this. It's like when you wanna to go to the bathroom and just have a couple of minutes to yourself and the kids start banging on the door. Everyone is looking for you. Verse 38, Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Um, you know, Jesus's response here indicates that he is in fact worth following. Jesus is different from a mom with four kids. Jesus is different from a mere human. You know, um, <laughs> When I have those moments when the kids bang on the door and they, you know, I just got in the bathroom, but they're looking for me and they're screaming, they're saying they want this, that, or the other. You know, my impulse when it's just Susie, Susie who hasn't had time to go and pray and be in a solitary place, uh, when it's just Susie, my impulse is, is just to say, no, don't bug me. Go ask dad, leave me alone. It, you know, and, and, I, I, I have this fleshly response because it's just me. If it's Susie plus Jesus, maybe I can respond in a way that is more Christ-like. But, but that's exactly the point here. We're trying to follow after Jesus. We're trying to be filled with the Holy Spirit, be more like Jesus in our responses because Jesus, he, he says to them, I came for your sake. I laid down my life for your sake. I came for your sake. And when it's left up to us, we can be very selfish human beings. Jesus modeled to us what it looks like to come for the sake of other people. And um, I'll, I'll reference just one last action sequence before I end. Here in the book of Mark, we're gonna look again at Mark 2, verses one through five. Um, Mark 2, one through five says this. Oh, let me grab my Bible real quick. <laughs> Mark 2, verses one through five says this. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by the four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat and the para lowered the mat that the paralyzed man was lying on. So when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. You know, any one of these, um, any one of these scenes that we talked about in the, the first chapter of Mark and here in Mark 2 uh, could be a sermon in, in and of itself. It could be a whole sermon series. And this one right here is a familiar passage to many of you. You've probably heard a lot of sermons about it. But, but I want to highlight just this one point that I see here, a parallel that I think is so great in the context of what we're talking about. See, um, this highlights the purpose of, of Jesus, of his life. Uh, there, there, there wasn't you know, there isn't a clear dotted line between these two points, but this time as I read this passage, it was clear to me that there was a parallel between the paralytic and Jesus. So what happens here is the men who came to bring the paralytic to Jesus were desperate for his healing, but, but there wasn't a conventional way to get their friend, the paralytic, to Jesus. Uh, the crowd was so big that they had to find another way even if it meant lowering him from above so that he could get to Jesus and get the healing that he so desperately needed. Do you, are you starting to see the parallel here? Our sin was too big. Our sin was so big and, and the conventional way of dealing with sin just wasn't going to cut it. And so uh, what happened here was that God needed to find a way, even if it meant lowering his son 
from above so that we could get to the Father and we could receive the healing and the salvation that we so desperately need. See, the purpose of Jesus' life was to bring us healing and salvation. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the disciples, as they followed after him, Jesus proved it over and over again that Jesus is the right choice. Jesus was a leader worth following. And so making the decision to leave everything and follow him was the right decision. And you and I, we are called to follow after Jesus and to align our lives with the purpose of Jesus as well. Read through the rest of the book of Mark if you need more convincing. Read through all of the Gospels. Read through the, the Bible front to back and, and you'll see that a life following after Jesus is a life worth living. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for meeting us here today in your word. Thank you that you gave us gospel accounts like the book of Mark that will lead us through the action sequences of Jesus' life. And thank you, Lord, for demonstrating that you are, in fact, a leader worth following. May we daily take up our cross, leave our nets, and follow, follow after you with all of our hearts unto your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, family, isn't that an incredible thing? Jesus calls us to follow him and be in relationship with him, just like Pastor Susie just reminded us I want to invite you to take a few practical steps to do that. In Matthew, Jesus says, come follow me. That's the first and only invitation you need to worry about right now. How are you growing in your relationship with Jesus? Jesus is here, ready to dive into that relationship. Here's a few steps I'd love for you to think about taking as you're feeling that invitation. The first one is this Tuesday online and then the 27th in person, we have a new to faith class happening. And that's as simple as that. If you're new to faith, we want to invite you into a, a space where you can ask questions, find out what things mean. Maybe you're coming from a different background. Maybe church is new to you. Maybe you don't even know how to read your Bible yet. It's a space where all questions are welcome and our pastors want to guide you on your spiritual journey. The main thing to remember is come to the class. Start growing on the journey. It's all about where you're starting from. There's no judgment where you're starting, how you're starting. It's about you and Jesus. So join us in one of those classes. Another thing that we do here that's a great step to take is we call it DNA. We offer it monthly here at both of our campuses and online. It's called DNA for many reasons. We want you to know your DNA, kingdom DNA. Jesus invites us to follow him and to be kingdom builders with him. That means you have unique gifts, unique purpose, all because of who you are. God wants to use that. As you love God and you love other people, we want to help you unpack your DNA and your purpose. And that's what we do in the DNA classes. We help you to connect to God's church and to your purpose. So both of these are great next steps to take as we really look at, gosh, the powerful invitation of Jesus. Come, follow me. I invite you to look at these two next steps. I invite you to jump in. I invite you to keep growing on the spiritual journey. You don't have to do it alone.